So today is Palm Sunday, and we're going to be unpacking a little Bible history. This is going to be fun, but I want to unpack the why behind Holy Week and who we are and Palm Sunday and the significance of Jesus ultimately being arrested. And then this Friday, I want to encourage you, don't just flippantly go through Friday. We call it Good Friday because something just shifted in the atmosphere. The moment Jesus gave his life for us, everything really did change. So Friday, take a moment. Don't just breeze through the day on cruise control. Take a moment and just thank him. Thank you for the price that you paid for my life. Even though I didn't deserve it, you did it for me because you said I was valuable, because you said I was worth it. And then next Sunday, y'all, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But today is Palm Sunday, where Christians all over the world celebrate Jesus's victorious entry into Jerusalem. And while this was a joyful, special occasion for his followers and even us today, this event took place towards the end of his life before ultimately being crucified. Now, again, Bible theologians, you know, we'll look at the timeline, whether it was a Thursday arrest, a Friday, but the reality was he came into Jerusalem and then ultimately was arrested, falsely accused, made, made, made everybody begin to speak lies about him and who he was, and then Friday ultimately was crucified. But no tomb, and I wrote this down in my notes because it just fired me up. The celebration that we have next week, no tomb could contain the unconditional love of God that was ultimately going to be released through Jesus. And there were so many times in the Bible where Jesus showed us the significance of who he was, not only as just a man, but also the son of the living God, but also who he was and how he lived out his life as our Savior. Pastor Jeremy said this in a past sermon. He said, when we recognize who he is as our Savior, he in return shows us who we are as his kids, chosen by God. How many of y'all were chosen by God? Come on. From nothing to something. From rejected to accepted. I was talking to my mom again. I talk about my story all the time because I'm, I, I believe with all my heart that my story matters. And, and I believe because of everything that I had walked through and everything that we had gone through. Some of y'all know if you've been a part of this church for any amount of time, you know I never should have made it. Even today, I had a moment. I was walking up the stairs in the back and I had this moment just like, God, thank you. Thank you on this Palm Sunday for giving me an opportunity to even declare the good news. Because in statistics, in my family, I never should have made it. Where's all my never should have made it's at? Come on. 16 of you. Amen. Got a bunch of perfect people. We're also doing an altar call for liars at the end. How many of y'all never should have made it? Come on. I wrote this in my notes and I asked them to put it on the screens and I want you to grab this. My past is the reason that I presently know that I don't want a future without God. My past is the reason that I presently know that I don't want a future without God. And so we're going to unpack these verses. Jesus was on his way into Jerusalem, knowing full well that this trip would end in his sacrificial death for the sin of humanity. And he sent a couple of his disciples to a village called Bethphage, about a mile from the city at the foot of the Mount of Olives. And he gave them very specific directions to follow. Now we're going to unpack a little Bible, a little verses. We're a Bible church. We're a foundational church. I don't want you to think that this is based upon our opinion. It was based upon my opinion to look like a modern day lumberjack today. That was, (laughs) that's what I put together. But this is what the Bible says in Luke chapter 19, verse 30 and 31. It says this, Jesus is telling his disciples, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here, and if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, say, the Lord needs it. Like real smooth like that. The Lord needs it. I love this. There's got to be a part of me, and this is just the way I process. I was thinking about it on the drive over here this morning. Jesus gave them very specific instructions. Like a lot of times God will give us direction, but not all the details. He did both in this moment. He said, you're going to go and you're going to enter into this village and then you'll find a cult tied there. And he goes through all these specifics. I'm sure they were like, okay, thank you, Jesus. And even though they had walked with him and they'd been around him and they'd seen miracles, there's something in humanity that says, do you really think that that's all going to be exactly like he said? Like we're going to walk around a corner and there's just going to be this miraculous, like unridden, like this is crazy, right? So true story. I was telling Carla in the back, uh, I was in New Hampshire preaching, 
And uh, afterwards, the pastor's like, man, what do, you want, what do you want to do? There's all kinds of things we can do here. In, in New Hampshire, we can go to Boston. And I was like, man, I want to see a moose. He was like, what was that? I was like, I want to I see a moose. And then to play with him, I was like, I want to see a bunch of them, a bunch of meese. And he was like, we don't, that's not how you say it. I was like, I want to milk a moose. He's like, it's getting weirder. I was like, no, I really want to see a moose. Like I've, all, I've, I've heard they're huge and majestic and all this stuff. I want to see a moose. And he's like, let's go, we'll do it. So we drive to an area where he always sees moose and we didn't see any moose. And, and for hours, I mean, I mean like not, not three or four hours, for six premium hours, we searched all over. And he's like, I don't know, where, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I, and I was like, are you joking with me? He's like, no, 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 like literally, I, I've see, I see moose all the time, man. I'm so sorry. And I was like, so we went to this little diner and we were on our way out and I'm an Enneagram 7, 8. So like the 7 in me turned around and I said, okay, I'm from out of town. I'm not from here. Y'all, I want to see a moose. Does anybody have a tip? Like, my friend let me down. I have not seen any. And then, I, and then I was like, I don't want to milk a moose. And that's when it got super weird again. And this guy stands up and he walks over. He's a deputy, a local deputy there. It's a true story. None of this is made up. He goes, uh, you want to see a moose? And I said, sir, you're not from here. You got a real, he's like, I'm from Kentucky. But I live here now. And if you want to see a moose, you're going to pull out of the parking lot, go down three blocks, make a right. You're going to go 15 minutes, and you're going to see a sign for used tires. And I said, okay. And he goes, right when you get past the sign, you're going to see you a moose. And he tipped his hat and walked away. And I looked at my friend like, there's no way. It's like a statue. Like, so we get in the car, and he's like, do you want to head back? I'm like, no, no, no. We need to go follow this through. Because this is going to be a, like a supernatural miracle if this happens. True story. We pull out. We make a right. Go up three blocks. We make a right. We're driving 15 minutes. Boom. There's the sign. It's this sign about tires, and they've got used tires, refurbished tires. I'm like, I'm not, okay. So we get past the sign. True story. Like in slow motion. That he could have cued chariots of fire. Like, doom, doom, doom. A moose walks really slow right out in front of us. And I was like, what? It was crazy. And then I'm like, did he radio head like, there they come. The guy with the beard send the moose out. Like, was it in a cage? Do you put, well, then, can you put a moose in a kennel? I don't know. And literally we stop and I open the door and it was like, Mah. and I was like, this is unreal. So specific. And I went home very, very happy that I saw a moose. Why are you telling us that story? The specifics are amazing, and Jesus begins to unpack this, and then the men, exactly as Jesus said, found a donkey, brought its colt to Jesus, and placed their cloaks on the colt. Jesus sat on the donkey and slowly and humbly made his entry into Jerusalem, and in his path, if y'all are students of the Bible, you know this story, in his path, people begin to throw their cloaks on the ground, and they begin to wave palm branches and throw palm branches on the road as he was coming into the city. The Bible says in Matthew 21, verse 9 through 11, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that follow shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Ultimately, the palm leaf developed into a symbol of peace all over the world. And this is why the crowd began to wave these palm branches and lay them in, because it was to show hope and peace has come. And I believe this weekend, I believe at this very moment, maybe you walked in one way, unanimously in agreement today, we believe Matthew 18, verse 19 and 20 is true, that if just two or three of us gather in his name, he's in the midst of us. The same hope. The same peace that rode in that day into Jerusalem is the same hope and peace that's in this room and watching online and at Katy today. Here's the reality. If any area of your life has felt hopeless, it's been under the influence of a lie because hope has a name and his name is Jesus. And we believe today, if you need a miracle in your life, if you need a breakthrough today on Palm Sunday, the same Jesus we're reading about is the same Jesus in this room. And I... Uh, and I was reading through, and it keeps on talking about how the Pharisees, who are the religious folks, they begin to question all of this. Why is there so much commotion about this, this, this man who's a liar? Why are the disciples and the people saying these things? And so the Pharisees begin to tell Jesus in Luke chapter 19, verse 39 and 40. It says, 
they said to Jesus, uh, teacher, rebuke these people, rebuke the disciples. You need to tell them to stop doing this. Like you need to shut this down. And Jesus answered and said, if they remain silent, the very stones would cry out. Jesus was conveying to the religious folks, to the Pharisees, that these people are longing for a savior. And if they are silent themselves, the very rocks under their feet would cry out for hope. It's a powerful statement. I'm going to give you a couple points of interest. Some of y'all are like, I did not know this was a big, huge Bible study. Come on, we're jumping in. Two points of interest I think are really interesting. Number one, when Jesus told the disciples to get the donkey, Jesus referred to himself as the Lord. This was a defining proclamation of his divinity. Number two, by riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, Jesus fulfilled an ancient prophecy. And the books of the Old Testament contain so many passages about him being the Messiah and all prophecies Jesus ended up fulfilling. For instance, the crucifixion of Jesus was actually talked about in Psalms 22 over a thousand years before Christ was even born. Bible scholars suggest, and I wanted them to put this on the screen because I want you to grab this. Bible scholars suggest that there are more than 300 prophetic scriptures completed in the life of Jesus. And here's one of them in Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine, it says, rejoice, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout out loud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous, having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. And it says this, the prophecy, this is amazing. This, this verse, this entire passage was a prophecy hundreds of years before it actually happened. So you think about the significance of hearing about it, hearing about it, hearing about it. And now all of a sudden the day has come where Jesus comes in on the donkey. Here's another cool fact about Jesus. This was the only instance in the gospels in which Jesus ever rode an animal. It's pretty cool. He walked everywhere teaching and performing miracles. For those of you who don't know, this is in the message translation. Jesus was the, uh, he started uh, Christ fit. <laughs> After the cross, it became cross fit. Okay. <laughs> Okay, on this, on this particular day, though, Jesus chose to ride in on a donkey because in those days, watch this, anytime a king came into town, they would be celebrated while coming in on a donkey. But this is key. If a king rode into a city or the city that he was the king in on a horse, they knew that they were still at war. There was still wartime happening. But anytime a war was over, a symbol of peace was when they would ride in on a donkey. The donkey was literally like a Bentley. And a, and a pony was like a Hyundai. <laughs> but he literally came in, and this was a huge statement by Jesus saying, I am the King of Kings. Come on, somebody. I am the Lord of Lords. And in this moment, he chose to reveal himself to show who he really was, the Savior of all mankind, the Savior for our, come on, y'all, I believe this, that the presence of God the same presence of God that we hear about and read about is the same presence of God that will reveal his self to you today in your marriage, in that struggle today, in that addiction today, in that family dynamic, in that diagnosis. The same presence of God Jesus walked with, the same anointing that he did miracles with is the same presence that's in this room. We believe that here at Hope City. Another point of interest, throwing cloaks in the path of someone was also an act of honor and submission. People weren't recognizing Jesus as the promised Messiah. Unfortunately, and this is where the story begins to shift, because they were screaming Hosanna. They were declaring Hosanna. Here he is. He's come. Peace has come. Hope has come. But the reality was they didn't have right motives. And some of you who are Bible students and you've been in church for any amount of time, you know that the same cries of Hosanna in Psalms 118 because the definition of the word Hosanna literally means save now or rescue. Instead of him, them recognizing him as the Messiah, the anointed one, despite everything that he had taught about what he would walk through and what he would do ultimately as that sacrifice on the cross, they weren't looking for a savior. They were looking for a military Messiah. They were looking for a Jesus to show up and overthrow the Romans. They were looking for a Jean-Claude Van Jesus. Like an MM fighting, like Jesus is going to show up and wreck the place. Jesus, because their motives 
weren't in the right place. The crowds refused to see Jesus as he truly was, the Lord and Savior. They acted out of an emotional place, a, a selfish place. And the same crowd on that very Palm Sunday that decreed and declared Hosanna was the same people a few days later that were screaming, crucify him. Think about how sobering that is. Ultimately, he knew. The disciples heard that this was going to happen did they really believe it? Because man, in the celebration moment, like, this is amazing. Like, everybody loves Jesus because they were looking at him as military Messiah. And ultimately, the same people turned on him and began to declare, crucify him. So this is super heavy this morning. Some of y'all are like, oh, this is typically a little lighter. This is pretty heavy, but I want to ask you a loaded question. Who is Jesus to you? So when you walk in, is this thing about religion or is it about relationship? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Jesus has been a, uh, here's some examples. Maybe Jesus has been a uh, fix it quick Jesus to you. Where, where it's like, hey, hey Lord, like, uh, can't you tell I'm going through some stuff? I know you're super busy, but can't you tell my bills are due and that all this stuff is happening around me? So can't you just fix it quick Jesus? Like I prayed the prayer. I did the whole thing. And like, can't you just fix it quick? Or, or maybe he's become your, uh, Convenient Jesus. Because statistically, they say that the average Christian reads their Bible 13 minutes a month. You've heard me talk about this. The average Christian prays 21 minutes a month. That's why we encourage the pray first challenge at Hope City. Take the first 15 minutes of every day, pray the first five, worship the first five, read your Bible the first five, because this is about developing a daily relationship with Jesus. Is it just out of convenience? Like when you can, oh, I should probably spend time with the Lord this week. Is he about convenience? Is it about showing up and you showed up and you put a little bit of money in the offering and you high-fived a couple people and you're like, I shook that guy's hand that I knew had COVID. <laughs> I just knew it. I could see it in his eyes. <laughs> is he just a convenient Jesus for you? Or maybe this is a heavy one. Maybe he's your accessory Jesus. You just kind of put his presence on when you're around your church friends. Like, hey, what's going on? And then you take him off when you're around your club friends. Come on, that's heavy. Is he your accessory Jesus where you just think you can take on and put, take off the presence of God? Here's the reality. The Holy Spirit is always with you. Always with you. He's with you in your car. He's with you when you're doing some of that. He's... my last time ever preaching here. I'm sorry, Pastor Roland. I don't know what just happened. Pastor, the real pastor will be back next week. But I feel like that that's, a, that's an issue that we're dealing with in Americanized Christianity specifically. So if you're watching online, you're in England, you're like, we don't have that problem. Tape it in. Like, maybe that's not you. But I feel like here, I feel like there's a lot of that going on where we just kind of show up. We're like, hey, brother, bless, sister saved. Good to see you. I've got my physical Bible. It has pages in it. And then you act messy and ratchet the rest of the week. Is he your accessory Jesus? It's a big deal because they didn't see him as their savior the moment he rode into Jerusalem. And I was trying to make this personal to me because I used to be that guy. I'll be honest. I used to be that guy. I was raised in a, in a good Christian home after my dad gave his life to the Lord because we were a whole Jerry Springer episode before he got saved. And then he got saved and we were in church all the time. And we were part of that. We were part of that late eighties, early nineties where it was a church alive. It was worth the drive. And they would drag us a 90 minute one way trip. I would sleep under the pews. Like we were in. And I remember growing up junior high, high school. And I was one way around my church friends, college. I was around my church friends. And then outside of church, I was two different people. I was double minded. And sometimes, you know, the waters would get a little muddied and and I, would, I was trying to pick up Jackie at that time. Trying to get, I was trying to get, like, get her attention. So I was like, what's up, girl? I was, you want to get some coffee? I mean, I was, I, I was just reading in Hebrews. You know, it's coffee from God. <laughs> if you, no? Okay. I was reading the numbers, and I, for, I don't have your number yet. And she was like, I don't, I don't have time for this foolishness. But the truth is, I almost took, took it off and put it on. Took it off and put it on. If that, if that, if that nudges your heart a little bit, I was talking to a police officer. Uh, I was sitting in the Target parking lot a little too long, and he pulled up like, uh, what's, uh, what's your business here? I'm like, am I loitering? Did I just fit that? 
And he said, uh, man, what do you do? And I told him who I was, told him I was a pastor, and told him about Hope City, invited him and his wife to Easter. They're coming next week. And, 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 and hey, practice what we preach here. And, and uh, we began to talk, and, and I started talking to him about the presence of God, and I started talking to him about uh, the things of God, and, 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 and we started just kind of unpacking like his life around his coworkers. And, and I told him, I said, man, I had another police officer friend in Ohio, and I went and did a ride along with him. And uh, he went to the restroom and I was sitting with all the other officers and they said, how do you know so-and-so? And I told him, I said, well, we go to the same church. And these guys busted out laughing, like, are you kidding me? That guy goes to church. So afterwards we got in the car and I said, hey man, real talk. It doesn't seem like you act like much of a Christian when you're around your friends. And he was like, oh. And we started talking about it. And he was caught up in that. Put on his church hat, take it off when he was around his coworkers. The Bible says in Colossians 3.17 that everything we do and say, we do it as a representative yeah. of Jesus. It's all the time. Look at the person next to you and say, it's all the time. There used to be this shirt uh, and thank God it's no longer in circulation. Thank God it's like no longer popular fashion. If you're wearing it right now, uh, I'm going to ask you to burn it later, but there's a shirt that I just thought was super flippant back in the day and no dig to the creators of this shirt, but it said, Jesus is my homeboy. Y'all remember that shirt? Remember some guy was like, I have it. No, I don't. I, I didn't want him to think that. Like it just felt flippant to me. Jesus is my homeboy. And I understood the premise. The Bible says he's a friend closer than a brother. But when my dad was cheating on my mom and hustling on the streets and full on uh, uh, struggling with addiction and alcoholism, we didn't need a homeboy Jesus to hang out with him. We needed a savior, an, a Messiah, an anointed one to restore and heal and deliver my dad. So what, what is he? Where, where does this fall? Where do you fall in this category? Because on this good Friday, on this specific Palm Sunday leading into Good Friday, I want you to think about it. Who is Jesus to me? Just close your eyes just for a minute. I want to ask you that. Ask yourself that. Who is Jesus to me? He's my restorer. He's my deliverer. He's my healer. He's my very present help in a time of need. He rescued my mom when she was at the lowest place. He delivered my dad when he was at the most broken place. It's not about religion. It's not about showing up and turning on air conditioning and singing through songs and just having a karaoke experience. This thing for me is so much deeper. He makes me want to be a better husband, makes me want to be a better dad. He makes me want to be a better friend and, and leader. You have to make this personal because they're selfish motives and agenda as they were waving their palm branches and throwing their cloaks in the path where Jesus came in on the donkey, ultimately to give up his life for the same people. Scream, crucify him. He sets us free because he says that we're worth it. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're at Katie. Maybe you're in this room and maybe you've had this misconception that God's an angry father who's mad at you all the time. And it's not the, that's where religion gets in the way. Hey, dad, I messed up. And religion says, I'm going to kill you. Relationship says, let me walk with you through this. Let me pick you up and help you. Because I'm not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. So who's Jesus to you? God sent his best gift. He bankrupt heaven and sent his best gift. We know this verse because we've watched football games and we've seen the guys at the back holding the signs, but John 3, verse 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that a handful of people, that very select people. Now, but, but what's it say? It says, but whoever, look at the person next to you and say, I'm a whoever. Come on, no perfect people allowed here. Even that most messy, broken, unlovable seeming person is still a whoever. Even some family members that I know that are full on hell bound in their mindsets. That if I'm not careful when I walk into a room, we're either going to we're going to throw down like it gets crazy. They're a whoever. And when I keep that perspective, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, 
that have eternal life. Christianity is not about behavior modification. It's about heart transformation. And if you're in this room today, it's not about you living perfect. God's not looking for perfect. He's looking for your heart. He's not looking for perfect. He's looking for for progress. So I'm asking the question again in closing on this Palm Sunday 2021. Who's Jesus to you? Is he the Is he the king of your heart? Because we've talked about fix it quick Jesus. We've talked about convenient Jesus. We've talked about accessory Jesus, but one that he has to be is the king of your heart. He'll pick you up. He'll fix, restore, and heal. He'll put stitches where you've needed Band-Aids. He's had this Band-Aid that just doesn't seem to heal, and he said, let me heal that. To put stitches, and you may still have a scar, which is a reminder of my faithfulness. Maybe you're here today, and you said, Daniel, here's the reality. I'm, I've had church hurt. I haven't come to church in a long time, and maybe somebody invited you. Maybe this was kind of heavy for you. Maybe you've been living your life in this category of one of these three, fix it quick, convenient, or accessory Jesus, and you say, the truth is today, I want to know him as the king of my heart. Maybe you're watching online and maybe you're at Katie, maybe you're in the room and, and you, you say, I used, to, I used to live for him, but I got caught up in the prodigal life and I fell away, but today is my day that I wanna surrender my life to, to Jesus. Will you close your eyes one more time? God, you can't just be a quick fix. You can't just be out of convenience. This isn't about an accessory Jesus. This is about you becoming the king of our heart. And in your word in Romans 10, verse nine and 10, it says, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be set free, healed, and delivered. Everything changes. Sin's thrown as far from the east as the west. Never to hold it against us again. No condemnation. Shame removed. If you're watching online, if you're in the room, you can type in the chat, you're talking about me, but if you're watching online and, and, and you're in that same spot, I wanna give my life to Jesus or I wanna rededicate Today's your day. If you're in the room, I'm gonna count to three here at Hope City. We will not embarrass you. I promise you that we're, we wanna walk with you. It's God's job to change you. It's not ours, but it is our job to walk with you and help disciple you. And here's the reality. When you surrender your life to Jesus, when you position yourself in a, in a posture where he becomes the king of your heart, there's this desire to not go back to the way it used to be. But there will be a fire lit and an anticipation and excitement for who God is and who you are through him. This week, you'll live out of your life and you'll live out your life as a daughter and as a son and you won't, you won't want to be silent. You'll want to shout from the rooftops about what he did and invite somebody next week to sit with you and talk about what he has done in you. I'm going to count to three and I want you to just lift up your hand. One, Daniel, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Two, I want to rededicate. Three, if that's you, lift up your hand. And hands are going up everywhere. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. I've lost count. You can put your hands down. Anybody else? Just at our West Houston campus. I know hands are going up at Katie. Again, in the chat, you can say yes to Jesus. Anybody else? I want to make him the king of my heart. I've made him my accessory Jesus. I've made him my convenient Jesus. I, I've looked at him as a military Messiah, fix it quick Jesus, but I haven't really known him like I know I need to. Anybody else before we pray, wave at me. Bring him in for a landing. I see your hand. Thank you. Hands popping up everywhere. Would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it hasn't worked. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. I give you my life. I lay every mistake, every sin, and all my failures at your feet and I ask for your forgiveness. From this moment on, I choose to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, can we give God a shout of praise? Heaven's rejoicing right now.